Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome back to the second session this morning in the Peatlands Gathering, and uh, hopefully uh, we can continue with the uh, excitement and stimulation. So our first speaker, um, my name is Catherine O'Connell, I should say, um, and I hold the chair at the moment of the Irish Peatland Society, and I'm also on the board of directors of the Irish Peatland Conservation Council. So very much on the NGO side of the Peatland story. So without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce Christine Domigan, and she is going to give us a talk on the EU Life IP project called Peatlands and People, and she's coming from NUIG. So take it away there, Christine. Thank you. Catherine, thank you. And hello, um, and thanks to everybody for the marvellous talks there before the break. So in Christine, you're just, uh, I can see your, your notes, so if you want to dis uh, switch display there. Thanks. Sorry. Yep. How's that? Excellent. Thanks, Catherine. And um, so I want to pick up on some of the points that were made before the break, talking about a holistic approach to peatlands and to climate change and action. And as part of that, we have our EU Life Peoples and Peatland um, programme. So most of us are very familiar with EU Life from the very successful Living Bog Life programme. There is another strand to the Life programme that talks to integrated projects. And these are large scale strategic projects and normally six to 10 years, and normally at a regional or a national level where you are implementing um, EU legislation or action plans. And within that, there's a strand that relates to climate action. So this is where EU Life Peatlands and Peoples comes in. And in summary, we're focusing on the Midlands and the project is a seven year project coordinated by Board Nomona in partnership with National Parks and Wildlife Service, the Environmental Protection Agency, Erin Innovation, um, ourselves here in NUI Galway and the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine, with a budget of approximately 10 million euros. And the aim of the project is to accelerate climate action. So um, peatlands and people is about connecting the peatlands and the policies and the people to move towards a more sustainable society and economy. Um, it's built on the Climate Action Plan 2019 and because it's a living project that's dynamically responding to developments on the ground over a seven year period. Uh, we will also be responding to um, interim climate action plans that come over the lifetime of the project. Um, there are five sections of the climate action plan that Peatlands and People responds to. So this is picking up on what Diana was talking about, about a holistic approach or an integrated approach. So we're looking at forest, agriculture, land use, land change. We're looking at the circular economy, waste enterprise. And um, we hear how important the economic component is and moving towards a new economic model. And finally, we've heard from Seamus and previous speakers about the importance of people on the ground, their daily lives, their lived experiences. So the project responds to um, citizen engagement, community engagement, leadership, and that leaving nobody behind, as well, finally, as demonstrating and kind of walking the walk, so to speak, all underpinned by peatlands and as the key integrating theme. So reflecting that integration, and um, we've got three powerful catalysts that we're simultaneously working on together that are intersectional, interdisciplinary. So we have a peatland center for excellence, looking at developing this new knowledge around ecosystems, biodiversity, the climate change mitigation adaptation, and um, water quality. That's our ecological catalyst. And then supporting that, we have a Just Transition Accelerator, which focuses in on the economic component. So this is our economic catalyst. 
allowing um, organizations, small, medium-sized companies, large companies, social enterprises, communities, move towards uh, low carbon circular economies at a regional level and national level. And finally then, our third catalyst is the social, cultural, the people catalyst. So this is where we want to develop uh, people's discovery attraction that brings us into the future, that opens up that sustainability, biodiversity, enhanced restoration future uh, for domestic visitors and for international visitors as well. So a little bit on the three pillars. Uh, pillar one in terms of our peatland site. Here uh, we are looking at 2,900 Natura 2000 sites along with Bordnamona sites, including high bog um, covering approximately 7,000 hectares. And here there is strong ecological remit coming through, which many of you will be very familiar about. So as well as the enhanced restoration, um, we want that scientific measurement, proof, the evidence base about emissions, greenhouse gases, air quality, uh, looking then again to the future and to other restoration work in other areas in Ireland and around Europe and around the world, wanting to contribute to the best practice guidelines, demonstration uh, research sites where scientists have access um, to sites and landscapes that haven't been accessed to before, all culminating in this knowledge generation, knowledge transfer and co-creation of a sustainable future. Um, this project was one of three funded by the EU last year, all just transition, and it's unique because it's a peatland based just transition projects. The other projects were coal region transition projects. Our second pillar then, um, just accelerator, and some breaking news here, um, the Accelerate Green is scheduled to be launched next week, and it's based in Bora um, in Bordnamona grounds there and will run up to May 2022. The tender process has been complete with the tender awarded to the Resolve partners and there'll be a launch event about that next week. And importantly, Two minutes remaining, Christine. Thanks. We're looking at Accelerate Green, where there's this triple bottom line approach where we're taking care of peatlands and policies and people. And finally, pillar three, then the um, iconic attraction. This is where we're reaching out into the daily lives of citizens, communities across um, Ireland, but also across the globe as well. And the vision is to develop an iconic, sustainable attraction. Uh, so think of the sustainability pavilion that's opened an expo. Think of the sustain the um, peatlands pavilion, and here we want people not just to learn about peatlands and carbon sinks, but to to work on a journey that's playful and fun, and develop feelings so that we can move towards that sustainable future. Because we know telling people um, isn't always the best way to bring about systemic change. But when you engage people and when they care and you activate an emotional response, then you can accelerate the behavioral change and the systemic change that we're looking for. And so in terms of long term impacts, the project uh, isn't a year launched, there are a lot of preparatory actions underway. And then the guts of the work are phase two with the restoration work um, and moving on towards the end of the project, looking for um, complementary funding, for example, through the sustainable development attraction for further continuation of the work towards the long term goal. Um, of 2050. For more information, uh, websites available, and you'll be hearing from lots of other colleagues as well. Thanks, everybody.
Thank you very much, Christine. I uh, love that slide of the little hair looking out at us. Absolutely beautiful. Thanks a million. And yeah, how we feel about things does not influence how we act. So we need to start feeling a bit more of the bogs, uh, slightly like Seamus Heaney and that. So we're going to move on now quickly to our next speaker, Fernando Fernandez. He hardly needs much introduction because he's one of the princes of peatlands and he's from National Parks and Wildlife Service. And Fernando is going to be telling us about the results of the three-year um, reporting rounds that are undertaken for the European Habitats Directive. Um, so Fernando, please take the, the screens um, and Christine and I will mute and uh, disappear. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me there? Yeah. Yes. Fernando, if you want to just put your um, screen into presenter mode. Um, so right down at the bottom. Apologies, we have tried this already. Um, so down at the bottom in the red, yeah, or that one probably works as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Is that working there? Um, no, just I don't know if you've clicked it in. Just down in the in the red at the bottom, the little um present. So to the left of where you are now. And I'm there left. Um so sorry. Right hand corner of the screen, Fernando. Uh, you were right over beside where there it is. Yeah, that exact one. Click Be sure there. and click on it. Fine, clicking on it. it again. Click on it again. Uh, apologies, it is not working there. Hmm. Um, apologies for this. I'm going to start sharing again. There you go. Apologies. Perfect. Yeah. So thanks for, for inviting me. My name is Fernando Fernandez. I've been working as professional ecologist in Ireland for the last 18 years particularly on the management, conservation and restoration of raised bogs. Um, uh, today, I want to talk about the results of the conservation of status assessments undertaken in Ireland for active raised bog since the Habitat Directive was transposed to Irish legislation. <clears throat> I'm going to cover the following topics, um, Habitat Directive uh, reporting requirements, the methodology applied, um, the results of the assessments and some key notes at the end of my presentation. For some of you who might not be familiar with, with what active raised bog looks like, there are some images on the left hand side showing nice areas with this facnum, um, beautiful microtopography. These are areas that are still forming peat that are alive. And on the right hand side, you see some images of non peat forming areas and no facnum or very little amount of facnum and not forming peat anymore. So in relation to Habitat Directive requirements and obligations, member states are obliged to maintain or restore favorable conservation status for Annex 1 habitats and Annex 2 species. Um, in Ireland, we have a total of 59 habitats, including Annex 1 of the Habitat Directive, and 10 of them are depending largely or entirely uh, on peatlands. Um, some of you might be also familiar with the term SSC, so SSCs are designated also as part of the implementation of the Habitat Directive. Um, in relation to obligations uh, um, for member states as regards um, surveillance and uh, looking at the condition of habitats, at, um, Article 11 is the one that states this. But it is Article 17, the one that states that member states are obliged to report every six years on the condition of habitats. And very importantly, they also are obliged to report on conservation me measures put in place to bring habitat to good condition. In relation to methodologies, um, the, the assessment of conservation status for habitats are based on the establishment of favorable reference values for three main attributes. And these are geographic range, area, structure and functions, also known as quality. So basically, <clears throat> these are the values that once they are achieved, we could say that the habitat or the habitats are protected for future generations. But on top of this, um, <clears throat> the, the directive also requires looking at impacting activities within reporting periods, also known as uh, pressures, but also as uh, impacting acti activities that might impact on the habitat in the future. These are known as threats. These are images of the uh, front pages of the assessments <laughs> undertaken in Ireland. The three, three assessments, 2007, 2013, and 2019. They are available on NPW's website. And I will let you draw your attention to the fact that the directive and Article 17 requires member states to report not only of the condition of the habitats within 
designated or protected sites, but within the entire country. And that's very important. So moving on, some of the assessments um, <clears throat> for active race bug. Um, that was the, these are the conclusions of the assessment completed in 2007. The assessments were done um, for 48 bucks within the network of protected sites. The range was assessed as unfavorable and stable. So basically, uh, we didn't lose active race bulk across the geographic range in the country, but is below the target. And this was one of the most alarming signs. We lost between 25 and 36.8% of active race bulk in the reporting period. The quality also declined and future prospects were uh, reported as declining. These were reported as the most damaging activities, pit extraction, drainage, burning conifer plantations, invasive species. Uh, what the report concluded was that although there were fewer cutters cutting turf within designated sites, there was an intensification in activity through mechanization. And in relation to positive activities, restoration work were implemented and new areas um, developed. Um, the final assessment for the habitat was unfavorable by declining. And overall, the assessment concluded that similar assessments of similar condition was expected within those sites, no survey, but very negative results will be expected for non designated sites. We move on to the next assessment, it was finished in 2013. The reporting period was 2006, 2012. 44 bucks were assessed. The range was again assessed as stable. And the area um, declining, but this time the losses were only 1.5%. It was a very significant difference from the previous reporting period. Quality was assessed as stable and field of prospect declining. Again, negatively impacting activities. The top one, the most damaging one, pit extraction reporting in, within 32 of the 44 box assess. And that was the beginning of the cessation, uh, turf cut and compensation the scheme by the department, by MPWS at the time and reported a decline in, in the activity, so fewer areas being caught within the reporting period. Drainage, again, second most impacting activity, burning, conifer plantations, and invasive species. Again, good re results seen and new areas developed after restoration works. Overall assessment and feeble but declining. And the assessment concluded that it was very positive to, to see a reduction in the losses, and that was a combination of lesser negative impact from impacting activities, but at the same time, improvement from restoration works. The assessment also concluded that impacting activities continue within SSEs and that future prospects were much more negative within not designated sites. Two minutes remaining, Fernando. Thank you. Uh, the next assessment was published in 2019 and covered the 2012-2018 reporting period. Fewer box assessed, only 28. Range again, um, unfavorable but stable. Area was decreasing, but we couldn't estimate the extent. Quality again declining, future prospects again declining. When we look at um, negative impacting activities, again, turf cotton continued within SSCs, but there was a decrease in the amount of areas uh, where this activity is taking place. High buck, uh, again, second most damaging uh, activity, followed by burning, conifer plantations. And for the first time, we reported climate change and nitrogen deposition as a threatening activity. Positive results from restoration works and the assessment concluded that these trends could change if the actions proposed in the SSE management plan were all implemented and particularly emphasized that there was a need to implement the designation of the new NHS, otherwise the habitat will continue as unfavorable by declining. The assessment recognized the amount of work uh, initiated in 2013, but overall negatively impacting activities um, <coughs> await the um, positive ones in the reporting period. Key messages, concluding remarks, um, the reporting and the Article 17 gives the same level of importance to all three attributes. It's very important to restore the habitat across the, the range, also the area and the quality. So all given some level of importance. It provides a, a consistency, it provides consistency in the report and across habitats and, and European countries. Provides transparency, the information is available to European citizens and to the European Commission. It's a very powerful conservation tool as 
European countries need to report on the on the implementation of conservation measures and increases accountability. Accountability basically, uh, EU member states could be brought to the European Court of Justice if the implementation is poor, and overall is a very powerful tool to provide guidance to European states as regards priorities for conservation of the most endangered habitats in the EU. Uh, and that was all. Thank you very much. Fernando, thank you so much, because that is an awful lot of work to report on. And if anyone has ever looked up the summary books, they're light. But you could definitely develop muscles lifting up the big, big folders of information that national parks have accumulated for our benefit. So thanks, Fernando. Well done there. Um, next speaker um, is Philip Perrin. And Philip works for Botanical, Environmental and Conservation Consultants, BEC. Um, and Philip is going to talk about fens in Ireland and I'm really excited to hear this speaking, this talk, because as I said to him when I was talking to him earlier, they're the kind of under underdogs of the peatland world. So Philip, take it away there and thanks a million. Thanks very much, Catherine. Can you see that okay? Yeah, perfect. Super. Okay, so um, as Catherine says there, um, my name is Phil Perrin. I work with uh, Beck Consultants, uh, ecological consultancy uh, based around the Dublin area. And in the last few years, we've been doing um, some work on uh, fen surveys for National Parks and Wildlife Service. So I'm just going to talk quite generally about fens and try to introduce them, make them a little bit, make everybody a little bit more aware of them. Um, there's something of the forgotten sibling of, um, of, of, of boglands. Um, somewhat underappreciated, but they're very biodiverse systems. Um, they're peat forming, of course, which is why we're talking about them here today, but there are groundwater uh, fed systems rather than being rainwater fed systems. So it's an important uh, distinction. Um, so um, there's various uh, types of a fen, they can occur in a variety of um, different landscape uh, contexts. So um, one can have fens in uh, open water transitions uh, where they develop around the edges of uh, water bodies of, of lakes. Um, and here you'll often get them uh, in mosaic with swamps or reed beds. Um, if the infilling of those uh, lakes uh, continues, then you can get the development of basin fens, where fen, fen, and fen peat occupy almost all of the uh, all of the basin, and you may have very limited amounts of open water left. You can also get uh, fens on on flood plain, uh, flood plains. So this is where you have uh, river systems, uh, stream systems, and they would uh, seasonally uh, inundate uh, the adjacent fens with. Um, with water and, and nutrients. You also get uh, fen type uh, systems developing in association with springs, uh, downslope from, from spring heads and spring lines, where you have um, uh, water coming out from um, the underlying bedrock. And you can also get um, a particular type of fen system called uh, flushes, um, poor flushes developing in the uplands where you have a uh, flow, uh, flow paths uh, down uh, slopes and uh, water accumulates. These are often uh, quite acidic in nature, can be dominated by, by rushes, by junker species, um, and they're quite, uh, quite common in the uplands. So fens can occur in a variety of, of different contexts. Um, but we, as Fernando has already um, hinted at, we have uh, special obligations for uh, particular fen habitats under the uh, EU habitats directive. So we have three uh, Annex 1 habitats, uh, fen habitats. Uh, the first of these is 7 to 30 uh, alkaline fens. Um, as you may be able to guess, this is, is calcareous in, in nature. Um, and it's uh, typically uh, dominated uh, by sedges, uh, in particular, um, black bog rush, genus nigricans. Um, but you may get other uh, species in sedge species, such as uh, common yellow sedge, Carex demissa. And um, we also here typically get a, a characteristic um, 
suite of species called the brown mosses. And these are um, species such as uh, rusty hook moss here, Scorpidium revolvens, marsh brium, brium pseudotriquetrum, which are uh, very indicative of, of calcareous conditions. So if the bog is in good condition and has good hydrochemistry, these species tend to occur. We then have uh, 7140 transition mires. Um, these are sort of transitional between uh, fen and bogs. Uh, they can be acidic or calcareous uh, in nature. They're also uh, typically quite unstable. They have a quaking surface, so they're a little bit exciting uh, to, to survey on. And these uh, tend to be dominated by species such as uh, bottle sedge, Carex ostrata, uh, common cotton grass, everywhere from angustifolium, and um, many anthes, uh, uh, bog bean. And the final uh, fen type um, that we have uh, is uh, 7210 cladium fens. Um, these uh, are uh, dominated by source edge, uh, cladium riscus, and they tend to occur um, in, association, in association with the other two fen types or, or similar types of, of habitat. Um, so Fernando has already uh, introduced the uh, concept of the uh, reporting that we're obliged to do on Annex 1 habitats every six years. Uh, if we have a quick look at the 2019 uh, results, overall results for these habitats, 7 to 30 was, was bad, uh, 7 4 and 40 was bad, and uh, 7 to 10 was only inadequate. Um, so the situation uh, in terms of status is, is not good. Now, why are we uh, struggling with these habitats? Um, Two minutes well, remaining, Philip. Okay, no problem. So um, why, why are we struggling with these habitats? Well, they're particularly uh, vulnerable habitats. Um, which um, can be easily um, unbalanced. Um, so impacts uh, which you may encounter include drainage. Um, fens can be impacted by drainage and also by infilling. Um, they may be overgrazed uh, by, by horses or by cattle. Um, they may suffer from scrubbing over, particularly where you've got, um, in combination, this could occur where you have drainage or where you have uh, maybe a lack of grazing. Um, birch and, and willow species in particular can start to encroach. And we also have uh, problems with eutrophication, where we have unwanted levels of nutrients uh, flowing in from um, particularly uh, adjacent uh, farmland, but also the, the prospect now of um, nitrogen deposition is something which we need to be concerned with. So um, one reason that fens are a bit underappreciated is that hitherto um, they've been the only major habitat type in Ireland which has not been the subject of a national uh, survey. This has now um, been remedied. We are um, working under contract um, for National Parks and Wildlife Service on a national um, fen survey, which uh, started this year and runs for the next uh, few years. And um, we're hoping to survey several hundred sites across the country, uh, which will help us to uh, monitor the condition of the sites and also um, improve the, uh, the mapping that we have of these. So we're looking to record vegetation uh, data and plots, uh, record water data, uh, pH and uh, electroconductivity. Uh, we're looking to record impacts, uh, such as those we've already mentioned, and also to produce uh, habitat maps uh, for each of the sites. Um, bends often occur in mosaic with other habitats, so they can be quite complex. Uh, uh, sites. So uh, in summary, um, fens are peatlands too, and uh, we need to um, give them due attention. Uh, if you want more information, um, please have a look at the excellent overview on the Wetlands Surveys Island uh, website. They have a very good uh, story map which will lead you through different types, uh, different types of fens. Uh, you can read up on the uh, Annex 1 habitats on the uh, MPWS website. There's a wildlife manual in publication which uh, will have the methods for the fen survey. And if you know of any uh, nice fen sites near you, then please get in uh, contact and we can add them to the list of uh, sites which we hope to survey. Thanks very much. Philip, thanks a million. And as usual, the BEC do a marvellous, intensive job on any surveys and that they undertake. And I'm 
delighted to see um, this Fen survey underway and it's something that um, the Irish Peatland Conservation Council have been asking for for many years, which brings me nicely on to our next speaker, Nuala Madigan, who is the Chief Executive Officer with the Irish Peatland Conservation Council. And Nuala is going to tell us all about the latest publication um, of the council, which is the peatlands and climate change action plan and action is something that our first speaker Diana was saying we need to move from conservation to action and like take the floor there Nuala and tell us how we can help. Thank you. Okay, good morning everyone. I hope uh, my screen is being shared with you all uh, this morning. So who are the Irish Peatland Conservation Council? As Catherine uh, introduced me, my name is Nuala Madigan, I'm the Chief Executive Officer. The Irish Peatland Conservation Council was founded in 1982 and our mission is to conserve a representative sample of Irish peatlands for people today and future generations to enjoy. This is our headquarters, the Bog of Allen Nature Centre in County Kildare, and we own and manage in partnership five peatland nature reserves nationally. Lodge Bog in Lullymore West, uh, local to us in Kildare, um, uh, Fenner Bog uh, in Waterford, Gurley Bog in County Meath, and Cold Bog in County Kerry. Our work includes peatland site conservation, species monitoring, peatland policy, research, and education and awareness. IPCC's longest running campaign is the Save the Bogs campaign, and it's guided by peatland conservation action plans. IPCC have developed seven since its foundation in 1982, and the latest conservation action plan is called the Peatlands and Climate Change Action Plan 2020, 2030, excuse me. And we should read this in conjunction with our Peatlands Conservation Action Plan 2020, halting the loss of peatland biodiversity. Today, I'm here specifically to talk about our new publication, Peatlands and Climate Change Action Plan 2030. This is the seventh action plan, and we launched it on Earth Day 2021, which had a very fitting theme, restore our, our, our Earth. And indeed, um, with, uh, in, in partnership with that, it, it is indeed the United Nations Decade of Ecosystem Restoration. Uh, we've made our peatlands and climate change action plan available on our website and um, so it can be downloaded free of charge um, or indeed if some people would like a hard copy you can also purchase it through uh, a, pr a print copy through our website online on our website www.ipcc.ie. So what are the aims of the action plan? Well in 2019 Ireland declared a climate and biodiversity emergency. The government has acknowledged that our country needs to act uh, with urgency on the causes and impacts of climate change. We've heard already today how peatlands are highly significant in the global efforts to combat climate change. The protection and restoration of peatlands is vital in the tra transition towards a climate resilient and climate neutral economy. To assist in the implementation of climate action plans, uh, we have developed this plan of action focusing on peatlands. Depending, the strong message within the plan is depending on how we manage our peatland resources. They can strongly contribute to climate crisis or they can indeed support climate mitigation plans and international biodiversity targets. The overall aim of the action plan are to ensure the protection of peatlands currently in good condition and supporting their range of ecosystems functions and to enhance the resilience to climate change of the entire country's peatlands through management, funding, education and a collective effort. So who is the action plan for? Well, the action plan is for all, including policy makers at government level to community members. It seeks to address a number of relatively simple questions that, ask pe that people ask in any discussion about peatlands and climate. Although difficult to give precise answers to questions, we have attempted to do that. The methods we used to gain this information was through academic research here in Ireland, published documents from government and internationally as well. So we aim to ask, you know, how much carbon is stored? How much CO2 is sequestered in our peatlands? Um, how much carbon can be saved by restoring peatlands? It goes to what are the restoration methods? What are the restoration costs? costs and what state are peatlands in at the moment in Ireland? And what actions we need to do? So within the plan, we've developed a 12 actions that we've identified, and we're knowing that calling this our peatland roadmap, roadmap. The building blocks on the road to success involve management, funding, education, and collective effort. To provide examples of what these actions are calling for, First off, we need a new storyline in education regarding peatlands and climate change. It must be developed and implemented across all curricula, back to back with a strong public awareness campaign. Again, we've already heard how people are connected to our peatlands in Ireland. And at a community level, there's a, a strong, um, strong engagement required. 
To give an example of how we suggest this happens, here on Lodge Bog and our local nature reserve uh, in County Kildare, we're already developing Lodge Bog into a best practice demonstration site for community members. Throughout this year, we've been invited, inviting community members to come along to upskilling days. We're showing people on the ground in our communities how to measure water on a bog. How to, speak, how to monitor species such as the iconic large heath uh, butterfly that's underreported in this country. Drain blocking, how does that happen on their heath plants? Encouraging community groups to develop uh, conservation action plans for their sites. We also call for the development of a 20-year, 1 billion peatland restoration and rehabilitation action plan to help combat climate change and set up an overseeing group to direct and coordinate the programme. Unfortunately for us, peatland restoration costs money. There's been real positive steps taken uh, this year and last year through the Peatlands Management Unit of the National Parks. Board of Mona are engaging with their, uh, uh, their, their enhanced rehabilitation on their, uh, on their cutaway peatlands. So, in Ireland, we've got real positive steps, but we see much more needs to be done. So where are we going to get this money from? Well, a carbon credit system, which would allow private corporations and individuals to fund peatland restoration must be developed. So as to increase uh, and maintain the level of funding streaming through the peatland restoration. So when we talk about this carbon credit system, we have to acknowledge that over 69% of Irish peatlands are in private ownership. That's within our community. People within our community need to be able to access funding so that they can do the work that they want to do on their peatlands. They want to be able to restore peatlands. They want to engage with their community members on peatlands, and this requires funding. So if Ireland wants to develop a carbon credit system, it would open access funding for not only state agencies or uh, non-governmental organisations, but also, most importantly, private individuals with peatland sites who want to actually restore, re-wet our bogs for their biodiversity and their climate. Two minutes remaining, Nuala. Thank you. Uh, a message that the Irish Peatland Conservation Council suggests Ireland present at COP26 is peatland management is the natural solution to our environmental crop crisis. Please access our Headlands Climate Action Plan uh, online at our website, www.ipcc.ie. And indeed, this was a very quick introduction into Ireland's Peatland and Climate Action Plan 2030. Thank you very much, everyone. Well done there, Nuala. I think you've actually saved a minute, which is fantastic um, and a very good talk. Um, and yes, we do need a collective effort. Um, I think that's coming across loud and clear and, you know, new funding streams that can be accessed by communities who are very much engaging, particularly in the area of raised bogs. And of course, we're looking forward to more work being done through various projects on the blanket bogs. So now um, we're on to one of my my baby, my my friends, Terry Morley um, from NUIG again. And Terry has been he masterminded uh, the Care Pete project and very excited now to hear how this project is getting on um, as it is very, very much applied to, you know, finding methods to benefit climate change um, uh, management methods. Don't want to be saying too much about the talk, but Terry, will you take the floor there, please, and tell us about the CARE project? Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, yeah, so I'm Terry Morley. I'm a lecturer and researcher over at NUI Galway. Um, and so I'd like to thank Catherine Farrell and o uh, Catherine O'Connell, the Natural Capital Ireland and the committee for setting this up. And also for everyone attending, it it's, uh, certainly highlights the interest that peatlands have gained in recent years. Um, that being said, I really hope that this event or events like this become recurrent and provides a voice for, for everyone interested in peatlands. So peatlands are certainly finding their moment uh, nationally and internationally. Uh, in part due to the decades of research and community conservation efforts here in Ireland. So you can see there are lots of peatland related projects going on right now throughout Ireland. By no means is this an exhaustive list. Um, and these projects will be crucial towards furthering our understanding of how important these systems are in the landscape. Um, current restoration targets are in the order of 100,000 hectares. And this is extremely promising, but more is needed and I think as, as all the other speakers have pointed out is 
the, the emphasis must be on to support local community scale projects with specific landowners. So the way I see forward again is, 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 is like Diana and others have said, uh, integrated approaches that support the local um, organizations as well as the national uh, through research and support. Um, this is a database we put together fairly quickly of existing research projects. So if you don't see yours listed, which is likely, I will put um, a link into the chat for you to add um, your project to this. But today I'm, I'm actually here to talk to you about the Interreg Care Peak project. And this is a partnership of five countries with seven different pilots in a fairly ambitious carbon savings goal. Our main objectives are to improve the emissions estimation and modeling capability and understanding, to push for policy change and uncover the economic needs and barriers towards rewetting, and to demonstrate and communicate effective restoration techniques by knowledge transfer and of course communication. The pilots consist of from small scale re-terrestrialization of former bogs from shallow lakes, as you see here in the center from in the Netherlands, to very large scale multi-landowner rewetting programs, as you see in the Valley of the Black Creek in, uh, in Belgium, to the establishment of carbon farms in the UK, which has involved, I think, uh, 150,000 sphagnum plugs, to more traditional restorations and some novel techniques here in Ireland. So what have we completed? Well, nearly all the main, uh, all the main pilot sites have rewetted. I might add, we also have uh, Bordnamona bog, cave mount bog included. Um, this is Klunko bog that's owned and rewetted by the National Parks and Wildlife Service as part of the project. It was rewetted last year using the more common method of peat dams, but also included more novel um, bunding approaches. Uh, with that, we know relatively little about the carbon savings capacity of this restoration technique. And so we're currently monitoring and measuring gases there, um, which I might add are recorded using the same methodology, methodologies across all pilot sites in the project. And if the image isn't clear enough for you to see the restoration effects, that I encourage you to join us um, and the Farm Peak crew uh, this weekend for the field trip. Uh, what else have we done? Uh, we've also worked with our international partners towards encouraging rewetting policy and restoration strategies. I'm going to stop here and say that most of this slide, the credit due here is to Neil O'Brolican, uh, who will speak to you all tomorrow about some of the other policy aspects of the project. But some of the important takeaways is the Greifswald Center uh, estimated that across the EU, if we wet just 3% of agricultural land, we can reduce upwards of 25% of agricultural emissions. For Ireland, rewetting 7% of agricultural lands means we could uh, reduce up to 32% of the agricultural emissions. We also pushed for wet agriculture and reorganization of, of the cap towards carbon friendly payments. And that uh, we see in, 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 the, in the new um, schedule. Um, but we, through this, we also recognize that there is a lack of an EU wide peatland strategy. So basically, taking what Nula said and applying that forward across the EU is uh, something that needs to be done. Um, and then we hope that Ireland will adopt some of the eco schemes that are proposed in the new cap. What are the, our ongoing works? Well, there are a number of challenges uh, with measuring greenhouse gases from peatlands. And one is this issue of scaling. You can see here um, these collar measurements and um, from scaling up from these local collar measurements to the landscape or peatland scale. And so we're using UAVs much like the iHabitat map that John's doing. Uh, to do that with the hope of producing a map like this that uh, assesses peatland greenhouse gases at the, peat, at the peatland scale. Two minutes remaining, Terry. Yeah, perfect, thank you. Our researchers have also reassessed published fluxes across Ireland since the last combined report in 2013. This analysis indicates a threefold increase in the number of peatlands monitored and fluxes measured within an eight-year period. And so we expect this to continue to grow at a rapid pace, given proposed monitoring increases and underscores the need for a common framework to, um, to assess these data. The analysis also indicates that more data is needed across all land uses, but specifically a need for more data and emissions on grassland emissions. 
An important take home from this is for landowners is that wetlands and peatlands in particular are nature's engines to reduce and store carbon. And so currently these engines are not working very well and there's a need to get out there and get these carbon engines working again. Lastly, to address this engine, we're reducing uncertainties of rewetting on private lands by using the greenhouse gas models developed earlier and the economic use data that Neil is working on to apply this to specific farmer areas at several, at several sites with the aim to provide an economic and carbon reduction analysis. Um, we're also involved with public education. We have a sphagnum transfer event uh, next week with the IPCC. And once we understand the guest approaches and these other um, indirect methods to estimate emissions, we'll be uh, holding training events next year uh, for that. And I also invite you to see Neil's talk tomorrow on some policy aspects. So lots and lots of people involved with the CARE project, both uh, nationally and internationally. So thanks to all of them and the decades of work from other researchers in Ireland and in conservation efforts at the IPCC. And of course, our field crews with which wouldn't really work. And Morris, you can thank me. I've summarized sort of the main takeaway messages. Um, any of the links here, uh, we have more links for the project, uh, YouTube, CarePeat, and CarePeat Ireland. If you have any further questions, you can contact me. Thank you. Well done, uh, Terry. That's absolutely fantastic. And there is some questions there coming in on the feed. So we'll have a look at those towards the end of the, the thing, the, the session. Uh, I just want to say thanks a million to Morris Eakin, who's doing the note taking, you know, the unsung and unseen hero here. So just to give Terry or to give uh, Morris a little bit of a talk up there. And I see now we've been joined by our next speaker, who is Shane McGuinness. Um, looking a bit uh, worn out there, Shane, as he was saying to me, he's moving house today. So everything always happens at once, isn't that right? So Shane um, is uh, working with the Community Wetlands Forum and with the University College Dublin. And Shane is going to be giving us quite an interesting talk here. It's how you find finance for Pete um, and diversify community-led investment in rehabilitation. I'm sure the pens are all poised now for you, Shane. So take the floor there. Thanks a million. Oh, God. No pressure, Catherine. Thanks very much. You have no idea, folks, how sweaty I was about 30 seconds ago, but all is well again. Um, thank you very much for the time, um, and thanks to all the organisers for this. It's an unbelievable event, and the, the minds, um, even on the programme alone, are something else. Um, I'll try, try and be as brief as I can. Um, it's a dense topic, and these really are just headlines. Um, as I was instructed to do. It's not a lot of time. Um, briefly speaking, um, I am the development officer for the Community Wetlands Forum. Uh, the map you see in your right there is our network of 30 plus organizations across the country. The green dots are the much more established sites. The orange ones, we would love to turn green in the near future. And the way we do that is providing a representative platform for community-led wet, wetland conservation groups across, across the country um, through the principles of community development. And that would be empowerment, participation, inclusion, self-determination, and partnership is a really important one, as you can see with that network. Um, as we all know, Ireland has this reputation of being very green, and there might be the, be the rhododendron there, as you can see on this John Hind photograph. Um, but John Hind's postcards also have quite a bit of brown in Ireland. So I would say we should be thinking about Ireland not as the 40 shades of green, but rather the 40 shades of brown. Um, and to that point, peatlands, and unfortunately the degradation thereof. And we will talk about this lots over the, uh, the, the next two days. And um, we all know how community degrad degradation has occurred, but also how industrial degradation has occurred. There is considerable amounts of that. However, despite that, there's fantastic value in these peatland areas, both in terms of carbon, and we all know how much carbon they both hold and they sequester continually for thousands of years. And um, at the moment, fully functioning raised bog sequesters 50 grams per meter squared per year, which is half a ton per hectare per year um, of CO2, not equivalent, and we all need to bear that in mind. And um, generally speaking, they currently emit three megatons of carbon annually, but if we restored them, re-wet it, we could in theory reverse that quite considerably. Um, maybe not to these particular degrees, but certainly considerably, and there is a lot of value there. In terms of water, well, again, we, we tend to know this quite a bit. Um, water quality in terms of filtration and reducing sediment load and reducing nutrient output. Also in terms of flood attenuation and the vast amounts of expense that goes into that annually in the like, Clonmel and coastal areas too. Um, soil stability also as well. We've all seen the, the bog slides and the forests drifting down mountainsides in the north. Um, and then also cultural and amenity values, which are increasingly prominent, especially these days in terms of COVID. 
Finally, use value, and there can be use value here. And some people have referred to Christ Paul Myers Center work and care piece work as well that are starting to tap this, I suppose. Current investment in peatlands in Ireland, where we're looking at around 29 million euro a year, and um, 96% of that is government spending, a lot of which comes from the carbon tax revenue through various other streams like just transition, etc. Um, restoring and rehabilitating all of Ireland's peatlands, however, would cost well in excess of 1 billion euro. And we definitely don't have that. We have a significant shortfall, but it's worth it. So five megatons of carbon at a good price of 50 euro a ton, that's already 250 million euro. And that's on carbon credits alone, if we can mobilize that. The state of play at the moment, the lay of the land, well, there's lots of different organizations working on this, which is fantastic. Terry showed a fantastic map of all the different dots, which is brilliant to see. There's lots of different programs involved with this, and they all go towards, generally speaking, healthy habitats, communities, and climate. But what I would argue here is that the vast majority of those stop at this dotted line. That is exactly their modus operandi, just to achieve that. There is no consideration of return on investment, either in terms of carbon, in terms of biodiversity, which is quite hard to quantify, in terms of communities, which is very hard to quantify, or in terms of water. Now, there is one program that is currently doing this and is starting to quantify this, um, but largely most of these actions are can be boiled down to cost of compliance. They're, they're offsetting our uh, EU natural obligations, our nitrates, our, all those other directives that we're obliged to adhere to, in addition to our climate change obligations. And um, what I would argue, and what I'm sure a lot of people here would also argue, is that there's vast carbon market potential. There's also water treatment and prevention um, in terms of flooding potential, and then lots of other stuff aside. So what this current project that I'm speaking about today now uh, is working on, Peatland Finance Ireland, is looking at this through a landscape lens. It's not just looking at purely the carbon or purely the peatlands or purely that particular group of people. It's looking at the entire landscape as a whole. Now, that might be a water catchment. It could be a county. It could be an entire country. Um, at the moment, we're working with a landscape finance lab funded through the European Investment Bank's Natural Capital Finance Facility and our National Parks and Wildlife Service here. Um, we want to identify the existing funding that is supporting peatland restoration in Ireland. We want to get, investigate potential future markets to support this. Um, can the stakeholder interest in, in entering that market or in benefiting from that? And then compose this landscape vision, this very large scale top down, attempting to pull all those different disparate strands into a singular vision that we can all work together. Because at the moment, all those wheels are spinning in the same direction, which is fantastic, but they're not necessarily all working together. And so in a way, we're reinventing a lot of those wheels. So what we would like to do is pose investable propositions at scale, and that scale would ideally be a landscape scale. If you propose it at scale, there's much greater interest, there's much more finance, which can ultimately be filtered down to those community groups that can do that work on the ground and benefit from it ultimately. Our initial investigation has found five key sectors that are really important to potentially support this in the future. The first is the wind energy sector, and there's various different positionalities at play there. And we, we, we don't have time to go into that today. And the second is agriculture. And if you think about the vast amounts of peat soils that have been converted to pasture or other forms of agriculture over the last while, um, that peat is still there. It's still emitting carbon because it isn't as wet as it should be. So that's an important uh, sector. International energy, there's vast interest in this internationally abroad for, uh, beyond Ireland, um, but we need to be careful about how we tap into that. However, if we can, in an ethical, moral way, then there's huge gains to be made. Irish food and drinks, well, Ireland has a really good story, a very strong story and narrative around our food and drink through Board B's works and Origin Green and even our international reputation around that. So that can be sold as well in terms of peatlands if we link it in the correct ways. Irish operating businesses, there are vast numbers of businesses, both individual businesses and networks that we can tap into that have both voluntary commitments and obligations under various, let's say, non-financial disclosure, um, EU regulations, um, EU taxonomy stuff that's coming down the road as well. Um, and also private impact investors. So this is quite a murky world and it's something that I'm really only starting to get my head around now, but there is enormous amounts of capital out there. If again, we can align it correctly, if we can verify and standardize whatever that benefit is, and if we can ensure that it lands with the people that need it the most. And we think we all know who a lot of those groups can be. In Three terms of our trajectory, remaining, Shane. thank you very much. In terms of our trajectory for this, first of all, we want to demonstrate the economic value. And in order to do that, we need to quantify the carbon of the water and we need to verify that through a verified carbon unit. We also need to find bottom up funding at community level and realize or secure that value. In other words, re-wet whatever it is, protect whatever it needs to be. We want to incubate innovation through either carbon farming, polluticulture, ecotourism or water services, and ultimately offer that as an ecosystem service bundle to investors using a novel standard like Gold Standard or Vera or other composite credits, which hit those ESG targets that companies are looking for. 
The timing is right for this. So we have climate and biodiversity awareness and the emergencies around all of that. We have great scientific understanding as this event shows. We have our economic tools, not necessarily applied in Ireland just yet. So that's a pro uh, something we need to do. We've got political change here, which is great. We now realize the value of these natural systems. And importantly, corporations now have both transitional risk and reputational risk to offset. As a very, very brief overview, and there's much more in-depth <laughs> conversation to be had about this diagram, but this is generally speaking the model we would like to, to adhere to. So we're looking at establishing what the carbon peatland fund, a peatland futures element to that as well, but also ensuring that that peatland monitoring and a peatland code potential is hosted locally and that we're not tapping into something external, that it is locally relevant and applicable. The next steps for this, well, first of all, we want to migrate the lo to local ownership of this project. It can't simply be a landscape finance lab project or an EIB project. We all know that it needs to be led by a local face, by a local set of champions. The second is to mobilize bridging resources to build this capacity. In other words, to buy the boots, to buy the dam building equipment, to incentivize those landowners or land owners to change uh, practices. We then want to formalize a hosting of the verification system, again, whether that's a peatland code or something else, doesn't need to be that, um, and then also establish a financial vehicle to house investment. So there needs to be, I suppose, what's called a clearinghouse for this investment, where it lands to ultimately where it goes to, in, importantly, to those communities that need it the most. Um, I hope I'm in time there. Uh, thanks very much, everybody. Uh, lots more to talk about there. Please drop us an email if you have any more questions. Delighted to take it up again. God, Shane, I'm absolutely breathless after that. What a head you have on you for, for business um, and peatlands as well. And I'm sure like, I'd love to go to a three-day masterclass on what we've just heard uh, in order to bring us into the zone, as it were. So that is an absolutely fascinating talk. So we just have about five minutes now uh, to answer a couple of questions. Um, there, was, uh, there was a bit of a buzz going on there, Shane, when you were talking. Um, but we have the first question was um, from Hugh Devlin up and he wants to know, um, you know, is there any integration between north and south of Ireland in the whole peatlands thing? And I might push that one on to Terry there because that map he had of the different projects certainly showed a lot of stuff going on up north. So would you give us a quick one on that, Terry? Thanks. Yeah. I think I can. I do know that there is um, transnational funding uh, availability to, to bridge north and south, and that's what we would we we would have to pursue. Um, but it would be at the at the top, you know, the top down level, and not really. There's no there's not much bottom up. Okay. Um, and somebody else, Terry, asked just how, what method you were using for measuring carbon. Um, I can't see where that question was, but it's in yeah. there somewhere. Yep, yep. So we, so there was an image of it really quickly. It's called a closed chamber method. We basically put a ring on the ground, and we have a clear chamber that sits on top of that ring, and it measures uh, the greenhouse gases from within inside that that area. And now there's a number of um, practicalities that we have to scale up from those. And and there was another question about how we identify that. Well, of course, actually Fernando and some of the other folks from the Parks and Wildlife Service went out and surveyed the, the bog ahead of time. And what we did is we, we place a number of collars in the most dominant vegetation types. And so we can get a good estimate with multiple collars from the emissions that are happening at each vegetation type. Um, and then you can scale that up once you know the area or extent of that vegetation across your peatland. Okay, and just to, I don't know if the participants can see the Q&A, but Trish has told us that Peace Plus through the Interreg allows for some cross-border funding there. So I, I don't know if people are familiar with that. Um, and let me just see, I'm not 100% brilliant at going through all this, but um, obviously like I really enjoyed all those different talks. And um, I suppose um, with the Fen one there from Philip, um, anybody measuring carbon emissions or carbon content in Fens, uh, Philip, off the top of your head? Not that I'm aware of, no, but that's that carbon emissions, that wouldn't be my area of expertise. So that, that could be going on, but I would, open it up to somebody else to chip in there. Yeah. And I suppose uh, the other thing I should say as well is congratulations to Fernando. You know, it's good to see that the impact of the turf cutting is has decreased in those two, the first two periods, because like it really has, it shows up the amount of work that mm -hmm. has been done in trying to um, 
take the community you know out of the bog in that sense and to fix them up in some other way because really the turf cutting issue is is a hugely um mm. impactful one but again it goes back to what um Seamus Boland was saying this morning that if we can't find an alternative fuel um, you know how how can we stop that impact on peatlands and and just wondering if Shane has any um, you know and all those uh, stakeholders and sources of funding and everything is there is that built in this, this idea of finding you know alternative means of heating homes other than peat yeah it's going to have to be um, as I said it's a landscape level approach that we need to uh, take it um, it can't just be banning something um, it needs to be providing opportunities and allowing this passive uh, evolution towards something else. Um, yeah, evolution, not revolution, as a lot of people say. It's not going to happen overnight. And this just transition that people presume is going to happen in the next year or five years, that's not how any transition occurs. So we need to ensure that there are adequate supports and alternatives for people to, to, to latch into and not necessarily be forced onto. Um, and I think for some of this anyway at the moment, certainly around home heating, that is the case and there aren't sufficient, let's say, deep retrofit costs um, being provided. OK, and just um, for the Nula mentioned the, the new storyline there in education. And uh, I just wonder, would Christine have anything to say about that since the, the you know, the, the 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 fancy title of the project, the Peatlands and People? So. Um, have you any uh, pointers there for Nula and the, the education campaign? Yeah, there is huge interest both among the youth and young people, as we already know, but importantly, you know, among um, families and among older people as well to move in towards sustainable lifestyles. So for some people, that sustainability is around energy. For others, it's around food. For others, it's around clothes. So we can use the, these different understandings of sustainability to get into that deeper conversation and that educational journey. And also, like a fun journey, a playful journey. So there, there's serious overtones to it, but we can present that in a way that engages with people and what they're interested at this point of time. And of course, the beautiful thing is that that storytelling will evolve as we ourselves evolve as well. So you might start a conversation with food, but that can bring you then into how we heat our homes, how we travel to work, um, and all of the other different aspects that peatlands and carbon sink and climate change brings us to. Yeah, okay, very good. Thanks, Christine. And Nula, can I give you a final word there in the questioning and uh, the discussions on um, what, what did you take from this particular session yourself that might help with the delivery of the peatlands and climate change action plan? Well, I think the most important thing that uh, participants should get uh, from this session is that we have challenges. Uh, Fernando spoke about the, the, the status of our bogs, but we also found the, the work that's ongoing. Christina talked about how we are doing, there's a lot of work on the EIPs, the, the LIFE projects, the National Parks and Wildlife Board in the moment. There's so much funding going into it to peatlands at the moment. And then both Shane and I spoke as well about, uh, you know, the financing of this, that private individuals are peatland custodians so while funding at the moment is streaming into state-owned land we need to look after our communities in this peatlands are cultural uh, significance to our, our local communities so we must we must act on that um, and then a, a, one of the fantastic news to come out of this was the national fen inventory it has been a long-running campaign for the irish peatland conservation council to calling for a fen inventory so really positive to see that work started in ireland so a very positive uh, session uh, delighted to be part of us Okay, hey, so listen, thanks to everybody. And um, Morris, I hope, uh, do you want to say something, Morris? How's the note taking going? God, he's on mute. Yeah, yeah. yeah all, all good. And of course, I can uh, screen grab some of the shots, which will <laughs> ensure that we get the key messages. Thanks, Terry, for doing it for me already. Yeah, so Great we've some session. punchy stuff there now. And the way we feel is very peaty at the moment. Isn't that right, Christine? And just to say, everybody is bombing the question and answers about up north. Uh, Ulster Wildlife are doing work up there, Queen's University on these projects have cross-border. Katrina Douglas is telling us about the CAB and the CAN projects. 
Um, and so there you are. Um, there's plenty going on um, nationwide. I think, Terry, you'll be putting a few more dots on that map of yours. Um, so listen, guys, thanks a million and girls. Um, it's a fantastic session. And I actually think there's a lunch break now, but you'll be having that at home. All right. Okay. Bye-bye for now. See you later. Bye.